right, I did it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, so update from the month of November. Um, yes, as Grace mentioned, um, we did uh, get the 2015 leadership plan and budget approved in the month of November, and we'll spend some time reviewing that today, but just getting that prepped and published out to the community. Um, it was a lot of work in November uh, for our staff, and we will actually have a community call tomorrow to uh, review the budget and leadership plan, what's in there, and uh, answer questions that the community has. So that's scheduled for 8.30 uh, a.m. Pacific time, and you can find more in the blog post at associates.drupal.org uh, to be able to sign up uh, for that. Uh, and of course, we'll record it as well and make the recording available to folks, too. Um, some other highlights from November, we started recruiting for the licensing working group. Uh, so we have about seven applications for the three to five spots that were, or the four to five spots that we'll want to fill on that working group. Um, and those are, uh, there's an announcement up on Drupal.org in the news section. Uh, so if anyone out there is interested in helping out with that work, uh, you know, go ahead and pull that out now, um, and we'll be presenting a slate of candidates to the board at the January board meeting for adoption there. Um, and then I just wanted to show off uh, some of the work that was done uh, in this, you know, around this time frame as well on the support side of things. Um, we were in, and a lot of us were in Amsterdam together, obviously, uh, and, and uh, we heard Bruce's keynote about uh, helping to create more social capital uh, in the Drupal ecosystem and how we can use Drupal.org and profiles to help um, drive some of that. So we have definitely been taking some steps to make that happen. Uh, one of the things that was recently deployed was uh, a change in how commit messages happen. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the, of the new system. And Josh, I don't know if you want to briefly fill folks in on how this works and what the next step is with org credit. Yeah, so right now it is a system to ge generate the commit message on an issue. And uh, in short, what it does is it summarizes for the maintainer who's going to uh, make the commit. It summarizes everyone that was involved in that issue, uh, whether or not they made comments, whether or not they uploaded files, which could be a patch, it could be a design comp, it could be num numerous things. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to include an author or omit the author. Um, and it auto-generates that little bit of text at the bottom that we can uh, use as the commit message. Um, there's actually a really good discussion going on right now for the next step, uh, which is all around what uh, contribution credits should look like for contributing organizations. Um, I think we're really close on that one, and actually um, I'm hoping to get a uh, comment out based on uh, some sprinting we did as a, a team here at the association to figure out how to implement, uh, what it would look like to implement those commit credits uh, that include organizations. Um, and so I'm gonna be posting an update with some implementation details and I'm hoping uh, Dries and, and Angie will be able to kind of round out the conversation on and, and we can start getting towards implementation for that next step. So that's one end of that, like being able to record the data. Right? Exactly. Um, and then the next end is the front end, which is, you know, how's this going to look on profiles? And I, I just want to, like, go back in time and remind everyone that we didn't really get to start building a tech team until April of this year. Um, and at the time that um, Josh came on and we started building the team, this is what the profile page looked like. Um, and so the social credit part was the long list of stuff that you said you had done, right? But that was all user-entered data, was not uh, driven by actual um, transactional data from from Drupal.org. Um, and then, of course, we have the sort of, we can recognize members and supporting partners, but there's not a lot baked in. And over the last few months, those um, those profiles have really started to shift and become more organized and start to be able to display that data in a much more meaningful way. So this is what it looked like, what, right before Amsterdam, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right around that time frame. Yeah, and then uh, this is what they look like now. So we're also getting those profiles set up both on the back end, getting the user fields set up in the right way, um, and on the front end design-wise, getting them set up to make that social capital more visible to the rest of the community. So um, this is what they look like now, and what we're you know working towards is some version of this, which um, Danny Norton did a lot of work on, and we spent some time talking to Kevin O'Leary, who did some you know work on that streets for your presentation and, and imagining what they might look like. And you know, this is the sort of thing we're working towards. 
And it's getting really close. We actually have all the fields migrated at this point. Uh, the board packet, I think, said that there were two left, uh, but that was at the time that I filled it in so that we could get it into the board packet. But yeah. um, every field has been migrated at this point. So uh, really the next step is uh, some layout work. And then as we start uh, calculating some of the contribution credits based on the data that we've been pulling, um, off of uh, user profiles, we'll be able to, to do a little bit more. We actually have some really exciting information coming there um, that we're going to try to figure out how to put into summary form in the next month or so that um, highlights user contributions across every possible contribution type that we currently track. Um, and there's some really, really fascinating stats out of that. Um, so I just wanted to spend some time on that because I know it's going to be an important um, thing for the association to support the vision there. Um, it's, you know, this is where we're at, is getting ourselves technically ready. And obviously, there's a whole nother, uh, I, don't, I guess you can have a bushel of worms, it's a can of worms, it's a can of worms. There's a whole nother can of worms in terms of figuring out you know, uh, a system around this for you know, valuing some of those credits and what that might mean in terms of some of Bruce's suggestions about you know, giving folks uh, sponsorship credit or advertising, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we are moving forward on the, the technical aspects here. So I just want to stop there and make sure everyone's clear about where, where we're at. Sorry, Holly, this is Angie. Just one quick question. Um, so the, I've seen a lot of the work that's gone into the user profiles, and I think that's great. Is there a similar effort underway for organization profiles, like to better highlight the contributions that they're making, or is that sort of tabled until after we get the storage stuff figured out? Or what's the... Oh. I think the first step there, uh, so we, we definitely are going to tackle the user profiles first for layout purposes. Uh, there are a couple things that I think we can tackle on organization profiles in the short term in terms of just making them layout a little nicer. Um, you know, if you're a company that has more than 20 employees with an account, uh, your page looks pretty horrible right now because it turns into a giant flag um, with the poll being your list of users. Um, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting metaphor, but we'll leave that there. Um, but So we definitely need to start with that, that user profile layout um, and just the general org profile layout. But as we look at those uh, commit credit formats and we start parsing that, um, as soon as that feature is there for people to start uh, adding that commit credit in a particular format, uh, there's no reason why we can't start collecting that org commit data. Um, and that, that can happen, our, our goal right now is that that's in place and that we're collecting that data in the, the February time frame. Um, and that we would be able to start displaying it. We're probably going to need about three months of data before we can do meaningful display of that data. So uh, somewhere around the, the LA time frame, you should start to be able to actually see, oh, this is how many commit mentions a particular organization has. Um, and most of that is around just the time to build up enough commit mentions that it, it looks meaningful on the profile. So we, we have enough data to know how to display it the right way. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of iconography. So we're not going to we're not going to parse it forward. I guess we can't really. Yeah. Okay. So it would only be going forward from whenever we start collecting data. We are we are going to back parse uh, all of the individual data, but we won't be able to back parse org data. Um, yeah, the only real way to achieve that from a commit credit standpoint, if we're actually doing it on the commit, uh, would require changing the commit message his, uh, commit messages historically, and I don't think we necessarily want to go down that route, but it, it's definitely a case where we can start it going forward. I will say, though, I think there are some things we can do with orgs that highlight other contributions um, that we can do more quickly. Um, you know, how many... How many sponsorships have they done? How many uh, um, how many times have they renewed as a supporting partner? Um, how many um, how many job posts have they bought on Drupal Jobs? Like the things that we can count, I think we can start uh, actually showing those on the profiles pretty quickly. Other questions about this this work? Looks like good progress to me. I wish we could go faster, but I know it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh... What's that, Angie? No, that was me. I was just saying to Drees, he always wants it to go faster. 
<laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think. I think this. I think. I mean, a lot of these things are. Um, I mean, well, the way I look at it, it's nice to have these little widgets to generate the commit message. I mean, it's a nice little improvement. I think the improvements to the user profiles are great. But I think the real game changer will be the organizational profiles and these more advanced systems that we can build on top of it. So, um, you know, I'm excited for the, for those things. Um, just a lot of steps in between, which I understand uh, why. Yeah, I mean, they just they go hand in hand, right? Like we had to do this base work first, so. Um, I'm I'm excited about the org profiles as well because I think we have an opportunity right now. We're very marketplace focused with our organizations um, instead of being um, yeah. contribution focused, and I think we can kind of shift that with the org profiles so that we're highlighting big organizations that aren't just Drupal service providers, but are you know big contributors to Drupal in really meaningful ways. So I, I think this is exciting because I think it expands what we call the community of users, um, and we can show it in a, a very cool way on the site. Um, but you're right; it's it's once we start collecting it, we're kind of starting from that we're, base. We're starting from that base, which is a little bit unfortunate, just in terms of where it falls in terms of the timeline of, of Drupal 8 and and contribution towards Drupal 8. But I think Ongoing, it's going to be a really powerful display. So, um, Ms. Jeff, so uh, yeah, I, I totally agree about you know we do want the focus to be on contribution in all of its forms, um, and that's good. It's unfortunate we can't do it for the past, but um, we do have an opportunity around this fundraising that we're going to push for for D8 too. So, in your list of examples, we should think about could we do something to highlight people who are uh, financial contributors to our D8 drive. Yeah, that's a good point. I think we absolutely could. Just about anything on an org that uh, we can tie to a triggerable action by the association staff or by um, people who have, have the elevated privilege to assign that, um, that contribution or uh, to award that contribution to that organization, um, I think we can start calculating those and using those to do things like determine the order of the marketplace layout. Uh, we've actually already talked about taking the first step of ordering marketplace organizations by uh, um, supporting level first and then uh, kicking into uh, alphabetical from there. If it's okay with you guys, I want to move on because I don't want to be stuck here all day. We've got other stuff to catch up on. But I, you know, obviously, if you have other thoughts, we want to hear them. But maybe in another menu. Take your silence. Your silence is consent. Um, so uh, <laughs> commit messaging and profiles. Those are huge. I think the other area on Drupal.org, just to talk about um, quickly. Um, um, I know. I know we spent some time talking about the investment we've made in infrastructure, but um, uh, you know, a lot of that was to pay off a lot of technical debt. And at this point, the, on the infra side, we've been doing a lot of work to move onto our own services and off of the OSU OSL stuff, um, which has been great because it's gained us a lot. That investment has meant a lot more efficiency for us. And I don't know if you guys have tried to use the site this week, but it's ridiculously fast now. It's so exciting. I remember sitting in Sydney with Angie trying to look up users so that I could link to their profiles in a blog post. And like, we literally search for a username, get up from the table, go to get a drink, come back, and my search results will be there. Oh, uh, Holly, that was because you were in Sydney. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I think it was Sorry. faster now, though. <laughs> um, it's so much faster now. Um, but I think the, the really important thing is that, you know, we're moving them either to our own services or on a third-party services at this point, and the point is that it makes Drupal.org much more portable, so we have a lot more flexibility in terms of how we – how we architect that site in the future, which is great. We'll touch on that a little bit in the infrastructure working group update as well. Great. So, so those are some big shifts that have been happening in November. I think the other big focus for staff has been on getting the 2015 um, working plans in place. Um, you know, we've obviously already sort of put a budget together and had some broad brush strokes, but the teams have been working on their particular work plans for the year. Um, uh, we have a new um, person on board, Carrie Lucina, who's focused on um, revenue uh, driven by Drupal.org uh, and 
So I know the Revenue Committee at this point has seen her work plan, but we're going to start seeing uh, more of that roll out in 2015. Um, we have lots of experiments there that are going to be going on. Um, and I think uh, just one other mention is, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if it's a D8 lift or not, but I'm going to say it is, but uh, I think for the first time in a while, we actually saw in the last two months traffic on Drupal.org equal to traffic for those same months in the previous year. So we're hopefully that trend continues and we're coming out of that traffic slump and that's going to support all of the community and revenue work that you know we need to do. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction again. Uh, and then just very quickly, uh, you know, one thing that we're watching very closely right now, DrupalCon Latin America registration. We currently sit at 82 folks. The goal is to have 400 people in the room. Um, and so we just passed the early bird deadline, um, but we, uh, so in a normal con, we would expect a much greater percentage of registrations to have happened by early bird, but uh, given the fact that we're both in Latin America and that the um, registration rates don't increase drastically between price points, um, I'm not, I'm, we're not sure to how concerned or if we should be concerned at this point, but we're just watching that a lot. Uh, and coming up with, uh, you know, alternate scenarios uh, for, for how we're going to deal with that. But uh, it's definitely happening. It's just a matter of how big it's going to be at this point. So any questions from the rest of that update? Okay. Lots more words in the packet. Should we move on to the um, committee reports? Have... Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, please, we can move on. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Megan, so. I'm going to unmute you for the revenue committee and then mute myself. Oh, you are. Okay. All right, great. Um, so the revenue committee uh, met this past month. Um, some of the things we wanted to share was that the the income's coming in pretty much as, as we've been projecting. We've had some great overages in DrupalCon sponsorships, and uh, Amsterdam came in much higher than we had anticipated. Uh, we were really nervous there for a while, and then everyone came back from vacation, and I'll tell you more about that in the Amsterdam wrap. Um, and um, did really well in the hosting listings and the web ads. We and It's great that we were able to go over in some areas because we had some soft spots, especially around Drupal jobs. Um, just kind of really finding that the workflow there needs to be improved, and Carrie and Josh and others are improving that workflow so we can improve conversions um, and get that set up for a strong 2015. And then also the supporter program was a little bit softer than we anticipated, and some learnings there was just that we need to really front load our year with selling that program. By the time we get into Q4, um, companies are just really not in a position to make commitments in the same way as they can earlier in the year, so we're making those adjustments now in our sales processes. Um, the other thing that we focused on in our meeting, uh, Holly touched on this a bit, was that Carrie came to the Revenue Committee and shared the different um, Drupal.org revenue programs that she is modeling and is ready to roll out, and Josh and the tech team are helping to build those products out. And so there's going to be lots of experimenting, um, and so the Revenue Committee gave their feedback, and we also started to brainstorm um, other areas for Carrie to explore. And we do have something uh, in 2015 Q1 to share that kind of information um, with the board so we can you know, make this more broadly known. Um, but it's certainly really exciting, some of the things that we're, we're working on there. Um, we've also come up with um, some plans for the Drupal 8 fundraising campaign that the board will be doing. And we're working together to get uh, training ready for the board retreat in January. And we also uh, started working on the co-marketing campaign uh, where we are going to sponsor two industry events next year in Europe so that we can have more of a Drupal marketing focus um, while our DrupalCon in Europe will be more of a uh, developer conference focus. And, and so we're starting to figure out what that might look like and which events to, um, to go sponsor. And when I say an industry event, just for those that don't know what that is, it's um, kind of like a 
like going to an e-commerce event and promoting Drupal and making sure we have a booth there and bringing in some companies, Drupal shops, and people with that expertise to help us highlight the Drupal message uh, to attendees. And that way we just get right in front of uh, the, the chief marketing officers and other evaluators for, for Drupal business. Uh, so in summary, that is what we've been working on. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the governance committee. Samir, is that you? Or is it list? It's Matthew, and I just unmuted you, Matthew. Matthew? Or Matthew, sorry, it's Matthew, I'm sorry. Uh, you are muted yourself, Matthew, at this point. <laughs> ah, there we go. How did I mute myself? Um, the government governance committee did not meet this last month, um, but we'll be uh, going over some some things that we discussed uh, a couple months ago um, later on in the uh, in the meeting. All right. Thank you. Uh, finance. So the finance committee met, but I did not meet with them to review October financials. Can you hear me? Yes. yes we can. Okay. Great. Um, and uh, the and also to review the operations work plan. Uh, for next year. All right, the executive committee. Um, we did not meet. So I think we can move right along to marketing. Yeah, during last month's meeting, I uh, mentioned that we were in the process of self uh, nomination for the marketing committee chair uh, position. We've gone through that process, and today we'd like to offer a recommendation. Okay. Um, there are a couple slides at the link there. Uh, that says new chair recommendation um, and the recommendation is Gina Montoya she is with uh, Blink Reaction um, uh, there's some information there on her background um, her marketing experience her experience with Drupal but uh, she does have some some great uh, marketing ex experience some broad experience uh, she's been in the community for some time now so, now, so she knows the community well uh, she actually knows Drupal uh, pretty well. She's got some some technical chops in addition to her marketing um, uh, expertise as well. So I think she would be a great fit uh, for marketing committee chair and would love to um, have her approved as the chair if there could be a vote. Right. Um, do, are, are you recommending we take a vote today or? If, you like you are. <laughs> if possible, that would be great. All right, yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Um, is there any questions from anyone on the on the board? Or uh, so this is Jeff. Um, just want to make sure. Do we? Does she have a copy of the latest charter? And do we feel we need to review or update the charter before? Uh, before I guess. Not necessarily nominating her, but but sending her into action, given that we've sort of meandered a little bit over the years on on what the function is there. She uh, is familiar with the most recent charter, which I think we uh, revised uh, within the last six months. So we're we're pretty current, I think, on the charter, and she is familiar with it. Other question has has okay, cool. Has, has, has she um, be involved with the marketing of Drupal in, in the context of the, the marketing committee, or, or is there no history there? Well, there, uh, frankly, the, the marketing pity, uh, committee has not been very active because there's been the lack of a chair, so she has not been uh, involved in that. She, she is a marketing person for Blink Reaction, so from that standpoint, um, she does market Drupal. Actually, and Blink Reaction have done a bunch of those um, funky videos and stuff around DrupalCon and stuff. So, I think yeah, they they've done some pretty innovative stuff, and um, they've been really active. Um, they they've been doing a lot of fun and innovative things, not just with their own marketing, but um, within the community and uh, highlighting what the association's doing and highlighting various aspects of, of Drupal as well. Has she been involved in any events or anything like that? I'm looking at her profile at her profile right now, and it's pretty pretty sparse. 
Um, she has primarily camps uh, that she's been involved in. Are you talking about on the organization side or just on the attendance? Um, on the attendance, I'm I'm curious as to as to how how uh, how involved she actually is in the community. She's at every DrupalCon. Yeah, she's she's pretty involved in the community. Okay. And, and again, I would point to Blink Reaction. Um, there's some great leadership there with Ray Saltini and others. Um, they're very involved in the community in general. Any other questions? All right. Well, if we do want to vote, I'd like for somebody to submit a motion. I move that we um, vote to accept Gina Montoya as the chair of the marketing committee. Second. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll second. Second. Now, third. <laughs> All those who are in favor, uh, please say aye. If you're not in favor, please say no. Aye. 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 I think I heard about seven or eight ayes and no noes. So I believe that is um, accepted. Thanks, Joe. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Will you inform her, Joe? I will. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for bringing her to, um, you know, to to finding somebody that wants to chair the marketing committee. I'm very excited to see uh, the impact of that. Absolutely. All right. <clears throat> I think the next item is the uh, DrupalCon Amsterdam wrap up. Yeah, Megan, you want to unmute yourself? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Oh, there we go. So, this is kind of Amsterdam. It happened. It happened a couple of months ago. So, uh, I wanted to just give a recap of uh, what we've done with that event in terms of hitting our KPIs and what attendance and our financials look like, uh, the feedback we got on content and um, overall feedback of the event. and. Also, some of our learnings and how we're going to apply that moving forward. Um, I also just wanted to point out that um, Rachel Friesen is the event manager uh, for DrupalCons. And unfortunately, because of timing, she couldn't be here to present it. So I'm doing it on her behalf. But you'll be hearing from her moving forward on these kinds of things. So if you can just ad advance the slide. So I thought I'd just do a recap of to help us all remember the excitement of this great event. So we had over 2,300 people come together. It was our largest DrupalCon in Europe. And it was really exciting, especially because we weren't sure if we were going to make goal. <laughs> then we exceeded goal. So that was wonderful. And people just came from all over. And people came on bikes. And we had another amazing uh, session with Jam and Robert Douglas and had a really diverse group of sponsors. Uh, and it was just a wonderful event overall. And I think we all enjoyed learning about Stroopwafels. <laughs> <laughs> and so why do we have DrupalCons? Just to kind of frame this conversation, we always go back to this. The board uh, met, uh, gosh, almost two years now to talk about really what is the purpose of a DrupalCon. So grow and strengthen the community, accelerate the project, promoting Drupal, and generating revenue to fund community programs. And so uh, we really designed this event to achieve those uh, different objectives. And so uh, also I know that the board heard a lot of this data um, because I did a preview of, of where we were coming in uh, right before we got to Amsterdam. And so I am going to share some of this data again for those that are listening in. I just wanted to put that in context. But in our board packets, we report out on our KPIs, their goals, and also things that are important for us to monitor. Um, to get some benchmark numbers. And you can see that um, there are really annual goals that we're tracking. But if we break it down to Amsterdam, the numbers were really great. Uh, when you combine it with Austin, um, we're really doing well in our KPIs. Uh, we did have some soft numbers around Austin, which is why uh, our 
attendance KPI is yellow, and also same, and that kind of is reflected on the revenue side um, why that's yellow. Uh, I do want to point out the net promoter score in Amsterdam did drag us down quite a bit, and that's why that is red. I'm going to go into that uh, later on in the presentation. This is what I couldn't forward yesterday. By the way. <laughs> All right, so anyhow, let's just dive into uh, attendance and financials. So compared to Prague, uh, Amsterdam really did an amazing job in terms of attracting people. Uh, and training, training really grew as well, and so that was really encouraging. Uh, business Summit, Community Summit also had really strong numbers, uh, not too much growth there. Um, but uh, if you want to just kind of advance, I can talk to you a little bit more about um, who attended. And so you can see that DrupalCon Europe is very much a developer event. 51% say they're developers, um, which is a higher percentage than what we have in uh, North America. But it's very consistent here in Europe. Uh, and just some other fun facts is that we also had more attendees that were members. And so <laughs> using DrupalCon to attract members has been um, a good platform for us. Nice to see that growth year over year. Uh, and also from a gender perspective, uh, we haven't really been moving the needle too much on attracting more females. We have about double this in um, North America. So something we also just want to think about as we are um, creating our diverse community. Uh, of those that are attending, uh, it's important to note that we have a lot of advanced attend advanced skill level. So if you can imagine a lot of developers that have an uh, advanced skill level that are coming to the show. Uh, this year we did have a little bit more uh, diversity on this front compared to Prague. We got a little bit more intermediate and beginner. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as we get further into the presentation. Um, it's also important to note that uh, of these people that are coming, we're really attracting uh, employees from Drupal shops. Uh, this is pretty consistent year over year, as we're seeing in, in Europe, and um, something that we're just going to keep looking at, especially if we want to do more, to attract more developers, where could we be attracting them from? I think the site owners, aka end users, <laughs> um, is a great market for us to, to help us move that needle. Uh, and we are coming together from all over the world, uh, 59 countries to be exact. I just want to drill down and let everyone see that when you uh, look at who's really coming, the attendees are really primarily coming from Europe. Um, and obviously, a really strong pull right around where the event was held in the Netherlands as well as Belgium, UK. Uh, obviously, US is still uh, a nice percentage there. But we don't really, you know, if we say we're international, it might be like one or two people from China, one person from Vietnam. Uh, some people from the Middle East, right? So some handfuls, but those are important community members that we're bringing in. It helps us get that international feel as well. And and so I, I don't want to um, marginalize um, the fact that we aren't pulling from all over the world. I just really want to point out um, that this is very much a regional event. And because we had this surge in the last two weeks, uh, for our ticket sales, we exceeded goal, which is really great, helped our bottom line tremendously, and it's going to help us um, fund our community programs. And I can go a little bit more into detail on the next slide. So you can see how ticket sales uh, versus sponsorships rolled in. Um, and we also identified some expenses. We had heard from some community members that it would be nice that we shared a little bit more insight into how the money was spent. And so we are providing this breakout um, here between venue, catering, AV, internet, and power. Um, obviously, uh, it's just really expensive to put on these events, um, and so we're happy to share more insight if people are looking for more detail on that front. Yeah, and I just want to take this moment, uh, Megan, just to point out that if, if folks are really interested in more detailed analysis of what exactly happened in a, at a particular DrupalCon, the way that we've established our financial reporting now, um, you can see uh, all the accounts for each uh, program that we run, including DrupalCon, um, Amsterdam, separate from DrupalCon Austin, uh, and those are in the financials that we post on a, a quarterly basis. So um, in January, when we post the fourth quarter financials, uh, so October, November, and December of 2014, people will be able to go in and actually see those totals uh, in those financial statements in excruciating detail, I would say. <laughs> 
Can you mean glorious detail? Glorious, absolutely. All right, so let me just kind of drill in so um, we can see what happened this last two weeks of ticket sales. And uh, this is new information, I think, for the board since you got the snapshot right as we were rolling into Amsterdam. Uh, and so 29% of registrations happened in those last two weeks. That was 661 wow. tickets. That's crazy. Yeah, pretty significant. 73% uh, of those registrants were conference conference tickets. Um, that's kind of a mixture of people redeeming sponsor coupons, but mostly it was people buying tickets. There's also 28% uh, of those registrants were people buying single tickets. Um, and also what I saw um, from that before and after snapshot of the data that I shared was um, UK was leading as the, the top country um, in terms of attendance. And in those last two weeks, the Netherlands bumped up. It was really people buying from the Netherlands coming in at the last minute. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, and so when I drill down into conference ticket registrations, uh, we saw an increase in beginner developers who purchased at the last minute. And that's why we have a slightly higher percentage of beginners. Um, it was about 11% last year in Prague, and this year was 15%. So I, I feel like we just had a lot of people that were kind of kicking the tires. It was close by. They said it was just easy to get in and, um, and learn some more. Um, and then, of course, it's just important to point out sponsors do redeem their tickets at the last minute. So that was one of the things that pushed those numbers up, too. Um, on the single registration front, 71% uh, of single tickets were bought at the last minute. Uh, and it's a, it's a great product that we've been offering the last couple of years, and, and it's nice to drill down and see that it was evaluators taking advantage of this. And it was also great working the Drupal Association booth um, on the exhibit hall. I talked with a lot of people that just said, oh, I'm just coming for the day. Uh, I'm kind of interested. I just want to see what this is all about. Um, some were developers, some were Drupal shops, um, and um, didn't really talk to any site owners. Um, who were evaluating, but it definitely just gave people that easy entrance in, and most of them bought their tickets for Tuesday, because obviously Tuesday you get trees, and so I think that's a real draw, maybe some we'll look at, I don't know, maybe I'll raise rates on Tuesday. You could change the name to Dries Day. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Raising the roof. All right. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and uh, take a look at the content and the feedback on our content, because obviously that's the real meat and potatoes for our, our events. Um, this slide, you know, you might want to take your time to look at this, um, but what it's really saying is in Prague there's a lot of Drupal 8 sessions that were highly attended, and in Amsterdam our top attended sessions were mostly Drupal 8, very developer focused. But if you go to the next slide, you can see what the top rank session was this year. It was a Drupal business session uh, for Drupal shops uh, held by Susan Rust. Um, you can also see that there were no sessions that were top ranked that were coding and developing uh, from that track. Of course, core conversations makes a lot of sense, but that's number two because we have so many advanced uh, developers on site. But just something that I want to drill down to kind of understand a little bit more about this data, but I thought it was interesting to share. Megan, what's the curl track? You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think that must have been a core combo also. I think so. I think so, yep. Curl track. Yeah, it's name tracks after people. Okay, so one thing um, that we should know about the session evaluations is that we did not get as many people participating as last year. That happened in Austin as well. And so we, um, as a team, are looking into this. Uh, to see what we can do to get more participation because this feedback is so critical. Um, so if you looked at the uh, sessions, the percent of sessions that got a 4% uh, or higher or a 3.5% or higher for their ranking, you know, those numbers dropped and that's that was a little disappointing. So we uh, drilled in and studied why and it wasn't the content, it wasn't the speakers, it was the room size. Uh, because we had such a surge of attendance at the last minute, it just really packed the rooms and made it difficult for people to get into the sessions they wanted to hear or it was just really too crowded. Um, and so that's something that we're looking at uh, to make sure we can adjust for next year. Um, and also just kind of wanted to drill into sprints, uh, just seeing really nice uptick in our sprints and obviously this is to help accelerate the, the program. And I just want to do a special thank you to our sprint mentors. 
Uh, we have a lot of people that come out to help um, facilitate this event, and uh, lots of great things happen there. Uh, and I do believe Dries gave out ice cream. Or was that in Austin? I might have just made that up. <laughs> that is right. I was actually yeah. really good ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should have done stoop waffles. Oh, but there was. I mean, yeah. I bought. I, 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 you know, I bought ice cream in Austin, but in Amsterdam there was also ice cream. Was there? Oh, good. Oh, nice. Yeah. No, there was this. There was this. Yeah, ice there was an ice truck. cream truck outside. I must have right. that. And there was actually you. better ice cream than in Austin. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Why don't we just go ahead to the next one? Um, and so this is just a summary of what I've mentioned, just about um, you know, uh, emphasis on Drupal 8 in, our, uh, in terms of what people wanted to go to. Um, and uh, we'll just keep working on getting more people to fill out those um, session evaluation forms. And you know, the scoring really is reflected on room size, not on the content. So I just really want speakers to, to hear that loud and clear. So if we can go ahead. Uh, we also have attendee feedback. And Drees, I just thought this was just great picture of you getting feedback from your, I don't know, your <laughs> duple, what's the thing, your doppel? <laughs> I get the word. Doppelganger. Yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm still taller than him. He may be yeah. funnier, but I'm taller. <laughs> there you go. You win. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's very common for um, people to want to attend DrupalCon to uh, hear sessions and network and grow their skills. We did see a switch in the reasons for people attending this time, and location came up. And wow. uh, that's, yeah, that was really important to hear, and we really nailed it with um, Amsterdam. And so, you know, location matters. And we saw that in the ticket sales for sure. Um, and then also, uh, in terms of, we asked people what was the most useful aspects. Um, in Prague, it was sessions, networking, keynotes, and so it means that we're really, like, they say why they're coming, and we're delivering great value there. Um, we do always see uh, that the exhibit hall has a little bit of, like, eh, not so useful. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see in Amsterdam, um, the same things were considered useful. So that's how we know that the content was good. The speakers um, really delivered. Um, the networking was great. Um, and again, the exhibit hall was you know, perceived as not very useful. Um, and so we're going to drill into that a bit, maybe look at the format of how that's um, orchestrated. But it could just be that because it's more of a developer conference, there's just a different perception of that exhibit hall. So we'll do a little um, assessment there. And also, I was a little surprised that email communication um, was had more people saying that wasn't so useful. So we're going to look into that. But overall, um, uh, we did also see some really good numbers around email communication and click through. So um, you know, we'll, we'll look into that as well. The one area that does it is concerning was that people felt that there was less value this year than there was the year before. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that in the net promoter score. Whereas Prague we had 49, Amsterdam we had 25. So we really drill down into people's comments to understand what is happening there. Um, and really it came down to catering. When we felt that we weren't going to make a budget um, because of softer ticket sales, we had to make some changes with catering. Uh, and we did three days of box lunch. We normally do one day of box lunch and two days of hot lunch. Um, and the box lunch came with a sandwich that kind of had just like a slab of cheese and meat. <laughs> it was not was not really robust, and so catering catering is a really important thing. And so um, it was a decision we felt we had to make, and couldn't make any changes at the last minute when we realized that um, there was more funding there. But um, it's something that we can really look at for Barcelona, and um, something we're working on now. Of course, coffee is another thing. Coffee and catering come hand in hand. We'll just keep trying to do more on that front. Um, and so obviously, our goal is to get um, that net promoter score up much more next year. So just in summary, DrupalCon Europe is primarily a regional developer conference. Uh, you can really see it in the demographic data that I showed you. Um, and, and so we really want to embrace that next year. We're also going to take a really close look to see what we can do to um, capitalize on location, keep uh, improving content and networking, because we know that's important. Uh, the catering, obviously, is a real driver. And we're going to look at room size. So one, one sorry to interrupt. 
I'm not 100% bought in in the, the regional parts, to be honest. I mean, like okay. only, mm -hmm. only 20% was from Amsterdam, from uh, the Netherlands. And even with Belgium included, it was only 30%. I mean, which is a good chunk, but I'm not sure it's so regional. If it's uh, I should say it's European. Yeah, I, so, yeah, I agree. It's for yeah, Europe, it's pretty European. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's very European. I think when I say international, I think global. Like there weren't a lot of people from Australia. Yeah, but it's still, it's still. Um, I mean, it's still most conferences in Europe that are less European. I should say. Mm, that's good feedback. I mean, I, I think people so, in Europe don't tend to travel much to co conferences outside of their country. So I think this is still pretty diverse. In, in just based on my gut feeling from having gone to European conferences. So. That's great. Well, that's great to hear, and it's also good to have that same vocabulary, too. So thanks for um, mentioning that. Uh, and so just to kind of close this out, you know, obviously looking forward, we'll just keep working with the community. They're providing great sessions. Um, we'll, we'll keep looking for ways to um, make sure that networking is happening. These are the real drivers. Um, and then I've kind of mentioned all the things that we're going to be working on. That We have a list here. And Rachel and Stephanie and Amanda and Lauren um, are all working really uh, closely to start figuring out how to um, make these changes quickly for next year. And also we'll be coming to you in Q1 of next year to talk about what um, DrupalCon in Europe can look like and how that can be more of a developer conference. So stay tuned on that front. One thing that I, I, I found uh, interesting about the presentation was the fact that most of the attendees come from Drupal shops. So that kind of implies that even as we shift it to a more developer-friendly conference, we probably also need a reason for their bosses to come. Um, is that an accurate feeling, or that we need to have the the Drupal shop bosses attending? Yeah, I mean, because the highest rated session was a you know a business session, and you know if the bosses are showing up, they're seeing the value of the conference as well. Um, yeah. As opposed to if it's something they just send all their developers to, like we worry about that kind of like. Things in a bad way you know, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to look at that. Uh, Joe and Lee have done a great job creating content for people to give to their boss and say, hey, come to this event. So we can look to see what the pickup was on that. I can also look to see if um, if the business owners are coming. I mean, we had great numbers at the business summit. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of feel like that audience is still always so hungry for real training. And Susan Russell is a real pro and business training, so I'm not surprised it resonated. So um, I'll see if there's anything to be concerned about in that front. What I saw there was an opportunity to get more developers coming in from um, end users in, in, as a market that we could tap into. Yeah, OK, gotcha. All right, thank you. And, and yeah. most, of these, most of these bosses would be developers themselves, actually, for smaller Drupal shops. And if you look at the business days, we had like almost completely new audience this year not many repeat visits for the business days, for example. So, yeah, I don't know how to read all of this, but it, it's really like, do we need to cater for these people? Like, we can actually ask. We, we kind of know who these, like, 100 or so people are. You mean to do a targeting targeted outreach? No, I, I, I think we can physically actually ask and just email these people and ask, like, what are you looking for this event? Do you, do you actually want to have like business content for yourself, or is it more important to have like, technical content and so on? So. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're. I think so. I think. I think there's a lot we could do for Drupal businesses, especially in Europe. Um, okay, so I'll I'll add that to the things to to look into. Any other comments? Questions? Thanks, Megan. Okay, thank you. Uh, I love I love that you guys do a deep retrospective. I think I think it's important that we we learn, you know, keep learning. So thanks for doing all this work. Very helpful. All right, let's move on to the um, budget and leadership plan. That's me again. Excellent. Uh, so. Uh, uh, 
you folks on the board should be pretty familiar with this, uh, but I did want to, for uh, you know, the sake of the public, uh, share some of the top line items um, just quickly. But again, we'll have an opportunity to go through this in more detail in a webinar or webcast tomorrow. Sorry, Joe, I owe you a dollar. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to sort of frame things where we're at, um, in, you know, in the last year, I think that the organization, uh, the Drupal Association, has done a lot of work to increase the transparency um, for the community um, and our accountability uh, to the community, um, establishing a dashboard, uh, having a budget, producing more detailed um, and uh, parsable, parsable is not a word, but detailed and parsable uh, financial statements, I'm going with it. Um, you know, all of that has been uh, really important for us to just to establish with the community that, um, you know, we're going to tell you what we're up to and we're going to show you our progress towards that and, you know, the stance will shift and our plans will change, but here's what's happening. Um, and then we did a lot of work also at the association to really professionalize uh, how we operate um, and I, I think wrote in here, you know, in a good way because I think we want to, um, we certainly want to be professional in all the ways that are positive and good in terms of, you know, Putting ourselves out there in the in the right in the right way and being responsive to people and, and all that good stuff without necessarily being you know professional in the stodgy way. Um, so that's really where a lot of our focus was in the last year, um, getting those systems set up, getting teams built, uh, being able to um, create things that create systems and process for communicating with the community. So. Uh, we built a really good foundation, I felt, in 2014, and we've got lots left to do as uh, we grew really quickly, um, and we're still catching back up with ourselves, um, you know, but mostly the point is we're still learning. Last year was the first year that we had a dashboard out there with metrics that we were tracking, understanding um, what we can do to um, move the needle uh, across, you know, across the organization, and we didn't always measure the right things. So uh, you'll see a lot of shifts in the 2015 leadership plan. Uh, we're going to try measuring other things, too. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the biggest struggles that we've had all year long is, well, we have sort of figured out how to sort ourselves and do our work internally well. Um, how to handle our work with the community has been, um, you know, we've had a lot of tension around that. And I don't mean tension in the negative way of, you know, like people are fighting, but uh, just, there's been a lot of questions we've had to work through. Um, to sort that out, um, you know, we want to maximize participation while also um, making sure that we are taking care of things in an efficient way, right? So we're still we're still working on that, and it's still a strategy that we're trying to to master. So that's just background information, sort of about like where we're coming from and, and who we are right now as an organization that I think really informs what you'll find in the leadership plan. Um, in our leadership plan, we always just start with our vision and our mission. Just as a reminder, this is what drives all of the work of the organization. So everything that we do and articulate should line back up here. Um, these are our big baseline filters. So if we're talking about taking something back on and it doesn't feed the mission, we, we don't do it. Um, when we are talking about revenue opportunities for, for Drupal.org, we try to find revenue opportunities that also align with our mission right, and are serving our community. Um, and we also do the same with our values. Um, this is something that we come back to all the time um, in the ways that we um, talk about our work. Um, just did a big session on values at our um, staff retreat uh, last week. So these are touchstones for our work as well. Um, in fact, we you know, had a big session where we got to talk about um, your keynote and what did we think that meant for the association and how can we have these conversations and, and move that stuff forward. Um, and uh, you know, there's a group who broke off and did a breakout session, you know, specifically around those um, those topics and how we make sure that our values continue to be represented um, in a system like that. So the values are the cornerstones. Um, those don't change very much. What does change year to year is our strategy for getting at that mission and vision. Um, and our two big strategies this year in all of our work is to uh, this one, the first one is a carryover from 2014. We're still really looking to enable, promote, and highlight community contributions. So again, big emphasis on making sure that even though we're professionalizing and trying to uh, provide a baseline of support for things like Drupal.org and Drupal Cons, these are still community, you know, community-driven 
places where individuals come to make awesome, and well, and organizations come to make awesome stuff happen. And we want to continue to make that really easy and really possible for folks. Uh, or make it easier and more possible than it was before, uh, if, if it wasn't easy to begin with. So that's really important for us. Um, and the second strategy in all of our work uh, is to be able to leverage the data that we have, our understanding of what's happening at DrupalCon or how users are behaving on Drupal.org to run experiments and make decisions more quickly. Um, and what that in effect means is no more giant projects. So no more, like, you know, we're not going to redesign Drupal.org from top to bottom and put a bow around it and drop it in the community's lap. We are going to break it down into components, test out um, certain bits of it as we go, and do things iteratively um, with, obviously, a, a plan and an end goal in mind. Uh, but, but we're going um, to be doing all of this work in a much more experimental way. Um, and that, of course, means that everyone here has to set goals for their experiments, um, and uh, there's lots of data involved in that. So those are our strategies for how we're going to approach our work. How do we do it with the community, and how do we do it in smaller iterative chunks so we can learn and change quickly um, as we go? The things that we really need to focus on for 2015, uh, we're going to continue to focus on Drupal.org improvements to carry over from 2014. Um, unlike 2014, we actually have some detail behind what this means this year because um, the team uh, with the working groups and uh, feedback from the community um, have launched a roadmap. Uh, so if you want to see what the big end goals look like for 2015, you can go to Drupal.org slash roadmap and get all the details there. Um, but again, we're painting broad brushstrokes. This is a place we want to get. Um, we're not going to define it perfectly right now. We're going to run lots of small changes while we learn about what that exactly, um, you know, what colors we're going to fill in on this picture that we're trying to paint. We also need to operationalize our, our revenue program. So we grew really fast this year. The board let us make an investment in building a technical team. Um, and we are really working hard at the same time on diversifying our revenue streams. We have lots of new revenue streams launched, um, new sponsorship programs, Drupal jobs, to name a couple of highlights. We have lots more that we're looking to launch in 2015, um, and we need to make sure that those are set up uh, so that nothing stands, nothing operational stands in their way of success. Uh, so that it's easy for us to run those programs, to deal with the money that comes in, to provide the service and the value to the community um, and to um, the folks who are, are giving us the money um, so that we are in a great place uh, by 2016 to support a steady stream of additional income. Uh, so that's going to be a really important thing uh, so that we can carry our work forward in the future uh, with a, a nice solid foundation of revenue. Um, and then of course a Drupal 8 release. This is another one that carries over from 2014, but we really need it this time. <laughs> right. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we um, support a release when it happens, that we make the most of that opportunity in terms of rallying the community um, and engaging them in that release um, and getting it out there in the industry in a smart way so that um, we can make this the best release um, that it can be. Uh, so. Uh, I just want to pause for a second because um, I muted Donna because her cat was very hungry, uh, but now she has a comment, so I'm unmuting her. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, Holly, I just want to go back to the Drupal.org improvements. I just went to Drupal.org slash roadmap, and I, I have a, a, a small concern there that my ex expectation of that URL would be it's a roadmap for Drupal rather than a roadmap for Drupal.org, the website. So I think ah. that, that, yeah. And then you look at it and you go, this tells me nothing about where Drupal is going. Okay. Let's make one or two. I'll leave that some more. Yeah. I'm done. Well, you can mute maybe me. we need to go to drupal.org slash dot org slash roadmap. That was a joke. That was a bad joke. Moving on. <laughs> 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 um, okay, that's fair. Anything else there, Donna? No, that's it. I'm done. So these are the three big areas of focus that the teams are really, um, you know, centered around. Um, 
we have we set KPIs in the leadership plan um, that follow up on those imperatives, um, and we have three levels of metrics that we track. Um, the first are sort of mission-based KPIs, so these are sort of top level. Do these numbers we think represent that we are um, meeting our big, um, you know, our big organizational objectives? Um, every team also has program-based objectives, so we do have metrics that we track specific to Drupal Cons, for example, attendance, revenue, um, you know, session evaluation scores, etc. Um, and then we have related data um, that we're also tracking that uh, might not be goal-related, but um, it's data that we think could tell us that you know um, what's happening. So if we miss a program objective, we can look at that related data and understand what might be influencing that that low number, right? Um, so we're tracking three levels of metrics across the organization. Um, what you see in the leadership plan, those are our mission and program-related objectives. Um, and then every team also has their own dashboard with their program objectives and a bunch of related data that they're tracking um, from month to month as well. Uh, so an example of what our mission-based KPIs look like, um, we have a, a general direction of you know, being a well-run organization. So we are interpreting that uh, mostly uh, through financial numbers at the moment, right, that we're able to pay our bills and, and um, also uh, that we are tracking to our budget. Uh, as anticipated. So, um, you know, are we able to actually create a budget that has meaning and then perform to the budget? Uh, part of a strong community is another sort of board, long-term board objective. Um, so we're looking at, uh, this, there's a change here this year. We're focused on um, all the community touch points. So we want to be able to show all the times that we're able to interact with a community member throughout the year. Um, as well of, as memberships, we think, is an indicator. Uh, we can increase membership number. That just shows that our value to the community uh, and the membership retention of those people stick around. And then growing Drupal adoption is another objective for the organization set by the board. Um, so we're measuring that by you know, increasing the number of Drupal sites that are out there. Uh, and right now, we're also measuring Drupal as a percent of the web overall. Uh, program objectives, uh, there's more detail here, and I'll go into a lot more of this in the uh, webcast that we do. Uh, we can just get a sense of how we track, you know, a layer of detail down for each of those programs. Uh, so that's what the work that we want to accomplish, the goals we're working towards in 2015, and then the budget is how we financially tell that story. Uh, so. Just to give you a sense of where we've come from and where we're going, um, this gives us a sense of 2011 through 2015, which is the budget that was just passed. Um, we've definitely grown a lot as an organization. In 2011, revenues were just over $2 million. Uh, in 2015, um, we expect to be over $6 million. Um, if you will recall our 2014 budget, uh, we were anticipating a negative $750,000 um, net revenue. Um, and that was that deficit spend uh, was approved by the board as an investment in the tech team um, that basically ended up getting deferred because it took a while to get that tech team on board. So we just didn't realize the salaries as quickly as we had budgeted. Um, in addition to the fact that we had a good chunk of change devoted to hiring contractors to get some work done. So we just wanted to accelerate what was happening on Drupal.org. But without anyone on staff to help manage those um, contractors, we, we used um, very little of that. So we will not have as big a deficit spend. And basically what we did end up doing is pushing a lot of that ask into the 2015 budget. And you'll note that we are looking at a deficit spend for 2015 coming out of this. Um, I think the key note is for us, again, this sort of underscores the importance of operationalizing our new revenue lines so that we can get the maximum amount out of them uh, by the time we hit 2016 and we can be in a revenue neutral place. Just to give you a sense of what the interim growth has looked like, and I just want to thank Rob Gill for introducing this sort of this chart to me because I use it in all kinds of things now. It's awesome to show any kind of trajectory. Um, but just to give you a sense of how revenue has grown and where that growth has come from, um, you know, the cons have been continue, you know, have been a significant source of revenue growth from year to year in the budget. Um, you'll notice that in 2013. 2013 to 2014, the cons are actually a, a loss 
uh, or you know, there's a, a decrease in um, revenue from the cons. And that would be because in um, 2013, we held a Drupal con in Sydney. In 2014, we did not run a third con. So there was no revenue associated with additional con, an additional con. Um, and despite the fact that we didn't have our biggest lever for growing revenue, we still grew revenue between 2013 and 2014. So mm. we feel really good about our ability to go into 2015 and turn on some of these new, um, these new revenue programs staffing to support them um, and really get to this much expanded place. Um, and if it looks like DrupalCon, like we're leaning more heavily on DrupalCon for revenue, the reality there again is that now we have a third con that's represented in the mix. So that's where a lot of that growth is coming from. Um, although we do expect some additional revenue uh, in increases from. Hey, Holly, I have a yeah. quick question on, on uh, how to read this. Yeah. Um, I mean, it makes sense, but it's um, so between 2014 and 2015. Yes. Are, are these actuals, or do I read that from uh, the end of 2014 to the beginning of, uh, you know, to the end of 2015? Yeah. Um, I don't know where so the beginning is, to be honest. Is there a drawing tool on here? I forget. No, I don't know. Uh, so basically, everything. Uh, if you go 2011, and then the green stuff that leads to 2012, and then the green stuff that goes to 2013, oh, okay. so, those are all actual. That's projections. So the last, the, that, yeah, where your mouse is, I guess, that's all projections for next year then. Yes. Oh, you can see my mouse. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah these, are, these are budgeted. Okay. Everything from here over, that's actual. Got it. Does that make sense? Well, that wasn't clear. Good point. Further level of detail for this chart. Uh, and I think uh, although we're we're you know we're, we had the same story last year when we were asking for a deficit spend. The important thing to note is that we're in a good cash position. Um, the organization, um, although we are cyclical, very highly cyclical in the way that we recognize revenue in our income statement because of the cons, the fact is that cash comes in very consistently throughout the year. So from a cash flow perspective, this really isn't an issue, and we are not going to experience any like very narrow months where it's like, oh, I hope you make payroll. Uh, we have cash in the bank, and cash comes in all the time. So we're going to be um, we're going to be fine from that perspective. Um, although I will point out that you know we only get to do a big deficit spend like this one time. Um, we're going to have to get ourselves uh, you know back to even after this. But I feel very confident that we can do that based on our um, what we've been able to do with revenue. Uh, just to underscore that, and this is some of the um, revenue stuff that Carrie's been working on and worked on with the revenue committee of the board. Um, we're definitely expecting to see um, lots of revenue, revenue growth uh, come from uh, the Drupal.org site itself. So um, hosting listings is one area that we've had in place for the last couple of years. Uh, we will see some growth in 2015, uh, but when we get the big Drupal 8 traffic bump, we anticipate we can grow that even more. Um, we are definitely uh, going to expand the web advertising program um, in 2015 and move that into 2016 in a significant way. So in 2015, we're going to do lots of experiments with that. Um, I do want to make sure that everyone is clear that it is not our intention to throw ads up all over Drupal.org. Um, that our intent right now is that ads show up in very key spaces, not in spaces that our developers tend to be in and that ads are delivered to users who are unauthenticated or not logged in. So if you're you know, working in an issue queue, uh, you're not going to see an ad in your issue queue, right? Um, if you're in the marketplace, you might see some ads. Uh, and then Drupal Jobs as well. Uh, you know, we're, we're definitely looking to grow that from its launch in 2014 to um, you know, uh, doing some tools improvements and building some systems around it to support in 2015 um, and to grow beyond that. Uh, and just to sh you know, share a couple of assumptions around this is that um, why we think this is ultimately very doable. Um, a lot of this is driven by traffic. And when Drupal 7 launched in 2011, Drupal.org visits increased by 30% over the previous year. Uh, so we're not going to base our numbers off of a 30% growth in traffic because that seems highly aggressive. But uh, we'll go with 15% to be nice and conservative. Um, and 
you know, that's where these numbers are being driven from. They're based on the idea of a 15% growth in traffic. So uh, the other thing to note is that we are making an investment in our sales force uh, and the operations that support them in 2015. So we should be in a great place by 2016 to really to really be able to hit these kinds of numbers, uh, which again would make us, you know, get us to a revenue neutral or positive place. Holly? Yep. Uh, this is Jeff. Apologize for the interruption, but um, that that number of in, that that increase on the job board does not is not consistent necessarily with what we've been discussing on the revenue committee, or at least in my memory. Um, I was wondering if Megan could comment on that. Are we comfortable with that that increase there? Seems big. Uh, when we looked at it the other day, we were going to go from 40 to 80, not from 40 no, to 215. It, uh, Did we, or am I wrong? 80. 80 was, yeah, those are numbers from this year um, that we had originally projected 80,000 for this year, but because of the different reasons we know about, we're going to be hitting closer to 40. So those are just 2014 numbers. And that this number is being supported by having a product manager, improved workflows, driving traffic um, from D.O. and lots of um, crosslinks and content management, as well as different campaigns that can really support this and, and a lot more work, you know, going behind this product than okay. we were able to do this year. It's worth noting, too, that this is also relying on the uh, deprecation of the jobs content type on groups.drupal.org. Uh, which we're counting uh, on driving a pretty significant amount of traffic to Drupal jobs. Yeah. And that actually, uh, was, that notification went out this week, um, and they will be completely deprecated by mid-January. What was the, uh, have we had any feedback from the community on that, uh, on, the, on, on, on the deprecation of that? I, I've had two comments so far. I, I just sent out the notice last night. Um, one of the comments was on uh, Twitter. One of the comments was on the issue. Um, very, I mean, for the most part, the maintainers who have been associated with uh, groups are really excited about the change, um, and it's been very minimal. The, the, uh, like I said, basically, two people providing either negative and or questioning uh, the, the move. Like, how are we going to make sure that small companies can still afford to post jobs? And we do have a plan for that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Where's the Drupal store? And all so this ironic, thing? since oh. these small companies are planning on growing and hiring people, and there's a cost to doing that. Like, yeah, for sure. I think one of the areas there. we're looking at is emerging markets. So if you're a, um, you may not even be a small company, but if you're a company in a emerging market where perhaps the financials don't align with, say, North America and Europe, uh, and we're looking what our options are there in terms of doing coupon codes or maybe doing some sort of grant process. Yeah, although well, Ryan just pulled all the data from the job site for the whole year, uh, what blog got posted there, and groups. from groups, yeah, and it's, you know. It's mostly North American Europe. It's mostly North American, and it's, yeah, it's like Johnson & Johnson, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to be able well, I think the, the big, the, well, and the big, the big, you know, question there for me, or not a big question, but I think the, the answer to a lot of that is, well, you know, we were providing that service. We, being the DA, was providing that service on Drupal.org free of charge for, you know, for goodwill reasons for a variety for a long time. Like, we're not honored to continue that process of sponsoring something for free if we have a product here. And even if we did, I would imagine you would want to drive the traffic here, regardless of whether someone pays zero or whatever the top package is. We don't want to be running the same service in two different places just because some people expect it to be free. Correct. Right. And, and How my, are we going to stop people just posting job ads in groups anyway? They just do it, with, regardless of if it's a job ad post. That's people a great question. Spam they'll, it. Right. They'll still do it in the. I mean, they'll still do it in individual groups. Right? And it'll be up to that right. organizer to um, to police their own group. And and right. actually, if, that's if they care about, about it. If they care some about it. Yeah. Like, some groups don't mind that jobs are posted there, and I don't think we mind that jobs are posted there. Right. Yeah. Right. It makes sense to have a jobs group. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Thank you. I think it's a good question, Jeff, because, yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I ran on LinkedIn. I ran, like, a local meetup uh, uh, group and uh, years ago, and it was, it was just relentless. 
the how many of the posts were really just job posts. Yeah. So it is a it is a problem, but I think we make it a policy and we hope people help enforce it. But um, to me this target looks the right like the right one to be honest, um, like a two hundred thousand dollar target. Yeah. Because what we need is we need these high margin products, if you will, that make enough money that we can help fund our engineering team. So if it was only going to be 80,000, I would be like, why are we doing it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I just I have a lot of reservations and concern just given uh, given that we've had it. You know, you'd think that the first six months that it was in production would be one of the highest subscription mm -hmm. rates, right? And if we if we were going for 80 and we only got 30 in the first six months, then you have to do something different in order to get 200. You know what I mean? In the next six months or a year, uh, and I think I heard a good answer. I thought from both from from both Megan and, or Holly and and uh, Josh. I can't remember who said it, but Josh's point about deprecating the existing job board definitely, I would imagine, drives some business there. And then somehow some continued or increased awareness about this uh, job board. I've been. I haven't seen yep. anything come to phase two about it. I would have thought that we would have. Okay been solicited a little bit more for for posting there so may, maybe a harder push of in awareness now that we've worked the, the kinks out and we're real proud of it we're, we're I have no doubt we can make two hundred thousand dollars with a job board personally because it's one of the biggest problems in Drupal and you know companies are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars finding Drupal people and you know in aggregate people are spending a lot of money trying to find Drupal talent but yes, I think we need to push it more. Like it's not even, even though it's one of the biggest problems in Drupal, it's not even on the main page of Drupal.org. That's know? actually, uh, that's that's something that we've put through the content working group, and we do have a plan for uh, putting the top three featured jobs on uh, the Drupal.org homepage uh, in the coming weeks. We're just squeezing oh, no. it into we're our... Just, uh, we're just going to the job board because so many people are trying to, like I think the problem is awareness, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think if we open it up and we drive more people to it, and we kill the other job boards on DDO, <laughs> then I think we have a good chance of making that number. Uh, yeah, I think the the problem is a clear one that people are interested in it. I think the the next step is just do they know that this is a place to to post or to look, um, and that is an awareness problem. Yeah, it's like with any product, it's like you can expect to build it and then people to just come to it. Yep, nobody has that expectation, I think, here. We're just, uh, you know. No, no, I know. I'm, not, I'm not trying to imply that. I think, I guess what I'm saying is I don't feel like we've actually pushed it right. to the extent that we could push it. So, right. in a way, the fact that we did 40,000 may be remarkable. Yeah, and I think the... Um, I think the uh, some of the work that we're going to do on the Drupal newsletter, for example, on integrating jobs into that, um, there's 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 definitely a plan to get it out there in a more proactive way. So I feel comfortable with that number. I just want to watch time again and shut up quickly, if that's okay. Um, so I just the last thing I just want to point out is sort of what does this work represent? Pro, what does the budget represent programmatically? Um, you know, the roadmap which is the Drupal.org roadmap, not the Drupal roadmap. Uh, three DrupalCons in 2015, so uh, Bogota, uh, Latin America, uh, Los Angeles, and Barcelona, uh, and then preparing for DrupalCon, uh, uh, an emerging market DrupalCon in 2016. Uh, community cultivation grants are still there. Um, you know, we're going to continue with that program. Um, the camp support uh, fiscal sponsorship that we do. Um, global training days, all that good community work is going to continue, and we'll actually see some more community work come out of this uh, as we get past Latin America. Um, and then some new programs, so the Deploy Accelerate, which you know, we just, just launched and are, are working on um, you know, clarifying and, and going big with. Um, the European marketing events, uh, mm -hmm. so we'll be able to get, uh, as, as Megan mentioned in a, a wrap, that DrupalCon is mostly a developer-focused event, and we still have a need to get Drupal out in front of a, an evaluator audience. Uh, so we'll be experimenting with that by going to a couple of industry events um, in, in Europe. Uh, and then we also have $100,000 in that budget for a design system um, consult 
um, as part of um, the Drupal.org um, evolution in 2015, and that roadmap. Um, and then uh, it does fund some new hires uh, as well. So it pays for all the 2014 hires in full now. So it looks like we're doubling the staff from 2014 to 2015. What we're actually doing is really um, fully realizing uh, all of the tech team hires or engineers or wizards, whatever you are to speak. And then um, it also funds um, the, the a new staff person um, who in part helps um, support the Drupal 8 uh, Accelerate program. Um, and then the additional staff we'll be hiring are focused on that revenue side of things because there's that imperative. And that is it. Anything else from you guys? So Holly, do you want us to vote on this, or oh. is this just an update and we may yeah. evolve based on the offsite that we have in a few months, or? Yeah, it's just an update, and I just wanted to share it out in the public board meeting. Um, because you guys have already voted to approve the leadership plan and budget in executive session at the last meeting, we're clear on that front. OK. Got it. Okay. All right. And then we can move on to the governance committee election recommendations. I believe that's an update from Matthew. Yeah. Um, let's uh, go directly on to the next slide. So what we're going to talk about real quick is uh, community elected seats and term limits. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So in the last uh, in the last uh, time that we talked about this, um, we were we were asked to sort of uh, uh, um, explore what the challenges were and how to how to deal with those challenges. And the biggest thing, well, some of the biggest things are that the loudest voices are often those that are most interested in doing something like cleaning house rather than that are those that are really actively interested in, in moving uh, the uh, the association forward constructively. Um, and I think that also uh, we also have uh, a situation where uh, those wanting to run are unaware of the real responsibilities of being on a board. Um, which is a challenge as well. Uh, and then finally, um, we've mitigated some of these challenges through through uh, through changes uh, in terms of transparency. But um, I do think that those are the two the two biggest things that we've got um, uh, in terms of challenges for community elections. Let's go on to this next slide. So there's a general agreement amongst the governance committee that we need some kind of bar. Um, that uh, that some one someone needs to elevate beyond uh, in order to in order to to run. Um, the last recommendation that we came forward with was serving on the committee, and it was felt uh, in general by the community uh, by the uh, by the uh, board that uh, that that was too that that was too uh, too high a bar. Um, and so we we uh, came back together and uh, and uh, talked a little bit more about it. And we came up with the, the notion that potential uh, candidates should maybe attend th three board meetings, not contiguous, um, and that those three board meetings should be over the last six months. Um, let's go on to the next, next uh, slide. So the benefits of this bar are that Holly can easily track um, who is attending the meetings. It shows effort and desire to participate in the process. It allows people to see what's involved in uh, in uh, participating as a board member. Um, so, what do people think about this? So, I, I have a question. Does this would this go into effect not for this upcoming round of elections, but for the elections in 2016? I think we couldn't do it for this round of elections coming up. Um, we just don't. We wouldn't have anybody who would uh, would have Be qualified. Eligible. Yeah. Okay. That was my that was my sense as well, but yeah, I think I think moving forward in a 2016 capacity, it's more than reasonable. We had a six move a little high for me, given that we have board members who haven't even made six. They have been six possibly, um, but I think I think the general idea of that is great because it's it's a low barrier to entry. It's a little bit time zone challenged if you're in uh, Donna's time zone, but otherwise. You know, it's a, and, and then you know what you're getting into, so it's sort of like training ahead of time. So plus one. And actually, on that point, I wonder if we should should be considering rotating the um, 
the reg, you know, the fact that we have the the board meeting at the same time every time might be worth us considering um, staggering it a little bit so that it, it's not um, time zone. I mean, it's fine for me. I'm used to it now, but it's a good point that it, it does make it impossible for some people to participate. I I would uh, I would be um, in favor of looking at uh, rotating uh, times if if other people are that doesn't that seems reasonable to me, especially if we're wanting to attract um, a a highly diverse uh, um, um, group of people. I'm I'm fine with that too. Cool. <laughs> could, you, could, you, could you could you could you clarify what that means? Like it means at least once a year you're all going to have to have the board meeting at 4 a.m. And so it'll we be would like go we would do our, once a year we would do our board meeting in Australia time. <laughs> yes. Sorry, yeah, I'm not trying to be the board meeting. I'm really just trying to understand. Um, no. I'm, well, Jeff, if they, I think it was Denise raised at, at some point that one of the one of the things that that she's seen is a common thing for uh, cross you know cross continental teams is that they they just rotate their regular meeting time so that it's not the same um, you know it's not the same time zone every time so, so you know someone's always kind of yep. perhaps not at their best but it's not always the same people so you just kind of stagger it a little bit. So mm -hmm. this would be for monthly board meetings. Yes. Yeah. The, the calls, not for in person. Right. So I would see. Right. In person would always be the local time. Uh, obviously. Hopefully. That's well, that's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll get up in the middle of the night. So, so would we do it? We would do it based on who's on the board. Then we would go West Coast, U.S. East Coast, U.S. Europe. Then, then we would jump to, I guess, in this case, we would jump to Australia, and then back to West Coast, U.S. If the board composition changed, and we had someone from China or India, we would then stop there on the way, and and so we just keep rotating that way. Is that what you're saying, suggesting? Mm, I would actually do. So I would I would look at how many people do we have on the West Coast. How many people do we have on the East Coast? How many in Europe? And, and we have a lot yeah. more. Australia. Well, we have a lot more people in those three locations than we do in Australia. No offense. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that's it. Would make sense to like. Well, it's know. it's more that it's proportionate, right? It's like it's it's okay that we do this in the middle of the night or you know really early in the morning for me because it really is only me. But if we're expecting um, other people to participate in our board meetings and making this a requirement for them to be a candidate, then you know, then it actually is something that we need to do from a diversity perspective rather than a convenience perspective because we're saying, well, hey, you know, you want to participate but you've got to do this, you know, at 2 a.m. your time, um, which is what it is for probably earlier parts of Asia. Um, and you've got to do that three times in the next six months if you want to put your hand up to be on the board. Right. But, but also, they're the ones that are trying to, to prove a commitment to the organization, not the other way around. Like, if we, I don't know yeah, that there's easy, someone... Yeah, it's easier to prove that commitment if you're in the U.S. and it's in your time zone than it is well, if but, it's in but, the United Right, but what I'm there. saying is, so as a board then, we're going we're gonna to then, we're going to then work towards someone that we believe might be interested in attending a board meeting in another No, meeting. no, no. I don't think that, I don't think we should do that. I think we should we should have a, a set rotation based on our board composition. That's, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Because I think otherwise what happens is we're anticipating where we're gonna get people. And let's be honest, our big problem is we just don't get anyone interested at all. That's the whole problem we're trying to solve. So, it's a chicken and egg well, problem. But but that's uh, not that's not true, Jeff. We never have a lack of of uh, of candidates for elected positions. What we have a lack of is people is people participating in the actual election. Can I? Can well, I, just, um, I think we have a I think we have a problem in both, right? I mean, we've never been satisfied with the turnout or or frankly with the the amount of interest <laughs> in the position. So can I can I propose that we maybe move this one offline and then come back to the board with a proposal? Well, because we're running low on time. Yeah. I think we yeah, don't need, I, I think the problem we're we're trying to solve at this moment in this discussion is separate from the idea of yes, can we right. 
is this a decent threshold of participation to demonstrate? Um, and then we can solve for how to make that, you know, how to make the board meetings more accessible in a separate conversation. And it sounds right. like everybody is is in 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 spirit uh, uh, in agreement that uh, that uh, having people attend a few board meetings um, to show interest and uh, a desire to participate is a good idea, right? Yeah. yeah I, I just I, want to I, register. I to say, have no, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I I agree. We should move on. I just want to register that we don't want to set that bar in such a way that it exacerbates our lack of diversity rather than it, um, opens it up. Right. 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 And, and, Can I and move I don't that want, we... I, don't, I definitely don't want anyone to take away that, that I'm just being selfish. I, I would be more than happy to do it, but I want to be explicit why we're doing it and reach out to those people and say, hey, look, you know, once a quarter, once a year, whatever, we're going to do the board meeting on your time to show you that we want you to participate. I don't want it to just be like, hey, it's, it's, it's a round robin of convenience for people. I want it to be more like we're doing this for a purpose so that we get Agreed. that effect. You know what I mean? Agreed. I think that the, the, the proposal on the table, however, from Governance Committee is a really good one, and, and it's basically that starting in 2016, um, in order to be eligible to, to put yourself forward for a community position, you have to have attended three board meetings in the six months prior to the election. So I, I'd like to move that we adopt that as our policy. I'll second that. I'll second that. I just have one, one quick question. I know we want to move off this. Are these meetings publicly recorded? Yes. So, like, could some listen to a recording in lieu of that even though we can't actually track that. No. I don't think that that should be, yeah, I think it yeah. should. All right, just just wondering, thanks. I think that's not the motion on the table, I guess, is what I'm, that's how I was answering it. Okay. Can somebody repeat the motion maybe, just to avoid confusion, if any? The motion is that beginning with the 2016 community elections, in order to stand for election, uh, the nominee must first have attended three uh, public board meetings um, virtually um, in the um, prior six months. And I'll second that. Great. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Um, those in favor, please say aye. Those not in favor, say no. Aye. 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 No. Aye. We're missing some people still. Did we lose people? All right, maybe we should do... Some of your set has to be. All right, maybe, um, sorry. Let's start over and let's say, um, please say your name and then I or no. Donna, no. <laughs> Matthew, I. Dries, Jeff, I. Vesa, I. Angie, no. Um, do we have everyone? Did we hear Samir? He, he said in the chat he has to leave. Yep. Do we get Rob and Mike? Yep, this is Mike here. I voted aye. Okay. Rob, are you are you there? He's not mine. He's muted. I'm an eye. There we go. All right. So, what is that? Two nos and six eyes. Maybe Angie can tell. Yep, that's my math. So I think it's accepted. Yep. All right, thank you. Okay, let's go on to the next slide real quick. Um, there was a suggest. There was a suggestion that we. I'm sorry. Yeah, before you go there, um, there was also a question on like the staggering of the meetings. Um, we are tabling it obviously, but is somebody following up on that? Yeah, I, can I think the governance up. committee will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So then there was a suggestion to increase the number of uh, of, of seats. I'm not going to read the slide. I'm just going to say that the governance committee at this point doesn't think that that's a a great idea. Um, that we should uh, we should uh, um, go ahead and uh, um, 
table that and see whether whether um, um, the bar uh, that we just set um, helps helps uh, solve this dynamic a little bit and whether the two year staggered terms um, are working. Um, any any thoughts on that before we move on? Okay. Um, then we also were asked to think about term limits. And uh, as we all know, term limits are important uh, for the health of an organization. Make sure that, uh, that people don't burn out. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way to, to just make sure that we get uh, new blood in the, in the board as well. So we, were su we, we suggest that uh, we pick a year and acknowledge that some folks will be over term, that some folks won't, uh, will, uh, will end up uh, um, going more than a, more than, a, than six years. Let those folks um, uh, uh, finish out the, their current terms so they rotate off gracefully. Um, and if we go into the next slide, we recommend that uh, the appointed terms continue at three years, that any appointee can fill two consecutive full terms for a total of six years. Um, we talked a lot about partial terms and uh, uh, thought, to, thought as a as a, as a committee that, uh, that we should uh, exempt partial terms. So anybody that's brought in midterm, they would uh, complete that vacant uh, seat time as an appointee and then they would be able to uh, sit for two more terms. And uh, the feeling was the same should be the case for elected community members. Uh, and then if folks want to be considered again, if they want to be eligible again for appointment after rotating off for a year, they could, uh, they could uh, um, reach out in terms of that. Um, thoughts on that? That seems reasonable to me. Any concerns? No, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Do we do we actually need a a, a vote on this, or is this? Uh, um, so we need a vote because it's a change to the bylaws. Okay. Um, so I move that um, that appointed terms should continue at three years. Appointees can fill two consecutive full terms for a total of six years. Partial terms will be exempt from this rule. And after rotating off for a year, individuals can be eligible again for appointment. Uh, I, I've got a question um, before we go forward with that is Tiffany, uh, we had a bit of a chat about this, does the partial thing allay your concerns on, on this because I, th I think you were feeling that six might be too short? Yeah, I think this is fine. I think as a as I'm, I'm slightly uncomfortable voting on it today because it is a change to the bylaws and, and when there's a bylaw change I actually like to see the wording change for the bylaws. Um, but, in, but in concept I have no problem with this. Tiffany, would you like me to, to uh, take this away for, for, uh, for until the next meeting and come up with some specific language for the bylaws? That would make me feel more comfortable. Okay, I'd be happy to do that if, uh, if everybody else uh, Everybody else is in agreement on that. Because then it could be a straight. Sorry, Tiff. Go ahead. I was going to say then that makes it really straightforward. I think you've got buy-in this time, and so it, it certainly addresses my concerns. Um, so I'm comfortable with it. So I think you know it's it's not wasted effort to try and put it in how we would change the bylaws specifically. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to 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 do that word crafting. Thank All you. Right, so be, before we do that, let's just do a like a straw poll, like is everybody, is, if anyone is opposed, it sounds like many of you are in favor, but if you're opposed to this, please maybe raise your concerns. All right, it sounds like everybody seems to be in favor with this uh, in principle. Great. Good. Well, th thanks for your time, everybody. All right. Anything else, Matthew, or that was it? That's it. That's it. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Great work. Oh, you're welcome. Just want to do a quick time check. Um, we only have 15 minutes left. Um, so I want to.
see, do we need to go into executive session or could we go and do the quarterly working group updates? We only had one thing via executive session which can be accomplished via email. Okay. I don't think there's anything that's not self-explanatory in there. Uh, if it turns out it's not, but it does need discussion, it's fine to push until January. Are you guys comfortable with that? To basically keep going with the open session and do the working group updates? Or Sounds does anyone mean. insist on the executive session? I'm okay. Yeah, let's just go. Oops. Great. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to unmute George, right? George, you're the most patient man ever. And you are now unmuted. It's your reward. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hello, George. Yeah. Hello, hi there. I will uh, try to go uh, pretty quickly here and uh, not take up too much of your time. Um, so, hi there. Uh, I'm uh, the, this is the Drupal.org content working group update. And if we want to move to the next slide, um, once again, a reminder of uh, who we are: uh, Tatiana, Jeff, Roy, and myself. Uh, Megan uh, uh, was on the committee. She actually stepped down in the last quarter. Um, but uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, that there's a couple folks uh, who are kind of ex officio folks who are not represented here. Um, and that's uh, Philip and Carrie, um, as well as Josh, uh, uh, who are have participating in all of our meetings and kind of representing uh, the marketing and, and content sides uh, of the Drupal Association. So um, uh, we are well represented. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, once again, uh, the kind of annual plan that we've been working on is doing the foundational work necessary to hit the ground running for uh, redesign of Drupal.org uh, next year, as well as assisting staff with uh, landing pages, marketing initiatives, content policies, and other issues as they arise. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, what we did last quarter, it was a very busy quarter for us actually. Uh, at DrupalCon Amsterdam, we uh, had a, a pretty well attended session where we uh, spoke with the community about the progress of the uh, project to date. Uh, spent a lot of time talking about the uh, work we did earlier in the year uh, with Whitney Hess on uh, the uh, kind of persona development and user research portion of the project, um, as well as kind of our roadmap moving forward into uh, content strategy uh, and then uh, into sort of the design system development. Uh, we drafted and issued a content strategy RFP and selected uh, after we had a lot of really great uh, folks uh, uh, issue proposals. Uh, we selected a forum one uh, to lead the project and uh, we actually had the kickoff meeting I think just two weeks ago. Uh, it was a two-day session at the uh, Drupal Association headquarters. Um, folks from the uh, content working group uh, we attended remotely, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, took turns uh, participating uh, in the session and then of course following along uh, with all the notes and everything and Tatiana does a very good job of keeping us very updated. Um, the uh, terms of service uh, which uh, had been put out to the community uh, this summer and had gotten a lot of pushback, uh, had come uh, back to us for uh, uh, after being revised and uh, we reviewed those, added some additional uh, comments, um, identified some areas that uh, we thought was important to uh, make sure the community really understood uh, what it was and what it wasn't uh, before uh, being um, uh, you know, presented to them again. Uh, and uh, that was a successful process, so the uh, terms of service have now been uh, adopted. And uh, we also, and this is something all the working groups were asked to do at uh, DrupalCon Amsterdam, uh, was review and discuss uh, changes to our group charter. And uh, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, the current project status report. Uh, once again, content strategy is uh, on track and going well. And then uh, the next uh, big thing that um, we're going to be kind of tackling as a group is uh, developing the RFP for the design system development, uh, which we'd like to issue um, early next year, um, most likely 
as the content strategy project as after it's completed or as it's wrapping up based on timing. Uh, next uh, slide, current challenges. Um, so with Megan gone, uh, we're, we're actually uh, short a member. Um, so um, that's, um, that's something that we'd like to address, but uh, that's related to the second item. Because our charter is kind of in flux right now and is likely to be revised in the near future, um, we'd like to actually hold off on that search for a new member until the charter uh, has been uh, you know, updated and approved by the board. Uh, you know, of course, it impacts kind of how we explain to folks what our group is about, as well as uh, you know, folks' potential willingness to be part of the group. And of course, um, you know, working group membership uh, does need to be approved by the board as well. So we want to make sure everyone is on the same page about that. Moving on to the next slide, um, what we need to be efficient, um, and and this was actually related to a lot of the feedback we had uh, in the uh, kind of all working group session where we talked about uh, you know how we can refine and change our charter. Uh, one thing that is really um, helpful uh, for us to have um, is a really clear understanding of uh, the board approved strategic objectives. Um, you know we are fairly fortunate as a working group um, in that we I, I think among the working groups and that we have a, a pretty clear understanding of the interests of the board and the strategic goals of the board and can be very responsive to those. Um, George, but I'm not, are you saying you have inside knowledge? I, I am saying <laughs> I have close relationships with many folks on the board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? How's Tiffany uh, felt about that? <laughs> some closer than others. <laughs> so, All right. I'm so you know, yeah, so that's an advantage that we have that that the other working groups don't necessarily um, you know have to the same degree, right? And um, and I think it's it's really helped us um, be able to take a very strategic look and to be able to look at the big picture. Um, and so um, you know if there's a way that that can maybe be better codified into our charter. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, the other, the other item, of course, is more interaction and alignment with uh, branding and marketing. Uh, we obviously have, uh, you know, working with Joe in the past and with Carrie, we have, uh, you know, pretty good interaction with Drupal Association marketing, um, but we really have no interaction at all with the branding and marketing committee. And uh, I think particularly in the work we're doing in the next year where we're really talking about how we present uh, Drupal.org and the Drupal project to the world at large, um, it's going to be really great if we're able to work really closely together. So uh, I know you guys just approved a new chair for that committee um, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, you know, working with her and working with the committee moving forward. Um, next slide, what we're planning to do in the next quarter. Uh, completing the content strategy project, reporting results to the community. Uh, we're hoping to have some uh, sort of preliminary results that we can provide to the board in advance of the retreat in January. Uh, we are not expecting that the project will be complete or that we will have final findings, but we should at least be able to give you kind of a, a preview of what we're expecting, uh, you know, will come out of this project. Uh, defining needs around the design system development uh, and developing the RFP for the design system. Josh and I have had a number of conversations about this and we've talked about it in our working group meetings. Um, you know, there's two priorities uh, that we're really looking at as part of this. One, of course, is the ability for the Drupal Association staff to not only be part of the solution, um, but to really own it. Uh, so we are not looking at this as something where we hire someone from the outside and they come in and they dump a bunch of stuff on us and disappear. We're really looking at uh, the existing association staff as well as any new staff members who might be brought on to really be part of this, to really own it and to be able to extend it um, you know, into the future. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Holly mentioned this earlier, rapid iteration and deployment of incremental changes, uh, which, um, you know, would be documented via a continuously updated living style guide. So once again, we're not looking at a large monolithic uh, redesign where it's turned on, 
uh, you know, all at once and every single page on Drupal.org suddenly looks completely different. What we're looking at is, um, you know, a rollout of uh, different design elements, uh, perhaps different uh, sections or uh, properties, Drupal.org properties that might receive more of the design uh, system uh, before others do. And so we'll have a really good opportunity uh, to just kind of test out um, different components, different sites, see how things are working, make tweaks, iterate as needed, and really evolve this as we go. Um, and then, of course, as I alluded to before, once the charter change has been finalized, uh, which, again, we're hoping will be in the next month or so, uh, we need to do a search for and nominate a new member uh, for your approval. So um, that's what I have. Are there any questions? If that doesn't sound like it. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, George. I really appreciate everything you do over there. Yeah, thank you, George. Appreciate it. Are you giving this one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Tatiana, and very, very quick update from Software Working Group. Uh, there were we do not change to our membership, so we are still our uh, Angela, Neil, David, Kate, and myself. And uh, previously, we were mostly focused on uh, prioritization of features and software requests to help uh, guide the association staff roadmap for next year. And once that was done and presented to the community in Amsterdam, we kind of switched to our next focus, which was update and working with the charter. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about uh, why we're doing this and how we're doing this. So basically, um, working with charters were written more than a year ago now, and uh, back then we didn't really have CTO and tech team consisted of two people. So the situation changed, uh, but charters didn't. So we kind of started to notice that they don't really match the reality a few months ago. And um, now that we also have a year since we actually created working groups for the first time, we are able to make some conclusions and see what really is working and what isn't. And all of that kind of um, pushed us to think about making updates to the chart of text. Um, the way we did it, first we started this, as uh, George mentioned, with all working groups meeting in Amsterdam, where we kind of got all the working groups in a room and talked a bit and all of us acknowledged that. Uh, there, there is a need for some changes. Uh, then Software Working Group, as well as all other Working Groups, had internal conversation and uh, came to agreement within Working Group on uh, general direction of the changes uh, for Charter. And uh, we had second All Working Groups meeting in November, which was remote, uh, we are talking about, where we kind of each Working Group came in with their suggestions for Charter changes and we discussed and uh, found some uh, same themes and uh, same ideas uh, across all the working groups. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, uh, once we have uh, the actual text, it will be presented for the board for approval. Mm -hmm. But just to give a little preview, uh, this is kind of the general direction of our thought. Uh, what we want to change is um, in particular, in software working group chapter, we want to say that uh, the role of the working group is more of advisory versus more of actually doing things. Uh, the working group would advise to CTO on the roadmap yeah. and provide input on prioritization of features. And uh, working group would also help with getting feedback from the community and distribute info from uh, us about plans to the community. Uh, the type of changes, uh, we also want to modify the leadership tools teams which you have right now. Uh, we have three of them established. So we want to kind of merge all of them into one body uh, with preliminary title as advisory group. Uh, and this is a group of people who are ex experts in specific areas of Drupal talk or specific topics. And we will consult them and get their input on prioritization and as we just 
do our incremental changes on Google the board, we will contact specific people who can give us specific feedback for this or that feature. So our next steps are to actually write the text now that we, are, we know what we want to say and try to get this text consistent across all the working groups. And this will be something uh, the association staff will do. Uh, once we have the text ready, we will read back to working groups for review and approval. And once uh, all working groups are fine with that, uh, the text will be presented to the board for approval. And we hope January, February timeframe when this will happen. That's mostly it for software working group. <coughs> Thank you, Tatiana. I think I think one other thing All to point right. out there is the we're, is we're keeping an eye on the. Uh, Go ahead, Angie. Hey, I can talk. Uh, one other thing to point out there is we're keeping an eye on the Drupal.org infrastructure blockers to Drupal 8. We still have a set of like seven or eight issues that. If all of the criticals in Drupal 8 are gone before those issues are, we, we have a problem. At the moment, we're sort of trusting the community to get those things done, but um, I think we're, we're monitoring that closely to see if that's going to actually happen or not. Um, I think, you know, I think another thing that we'll probably work on over the next quarter is, um, you know, just setting up better communication between the teams and stuff like that, too. Um, I, I've got a thought on the on these three these three teams, and it's sort of been bubbling around in my head ever since Prague when they all came together for the first time. I think I think it would be really useful for these uh, for these three groups to have a formal face-to-face -face outside of the pressures of DrupalCon. I don't know. I think budget-wise, that it, you know, it's probably um, going to be difficult. And some of those members might need to be sponsored by by people to be there. But I think it would be really useful if if um, if we could facilitate that happening. Like we have our strategic board retreat, I think these groups need to have something similar. I don't know that there's as much overlap in those groups as you might think. Um, they're actually pretty well cordoned off from one another. Like there are places. I think that's the problem. Well, no, I, I don't think it is. I think the I think a bigger problem is I I could support something like that plus the Drupal Association tech staff or something like yep. that. Yep, I think the biggest yep. problem is that these groups are all, like, there's this thing in the center, and I don't think all of us have met all of the people on the other side and that kind of thing. So it's like mm -hmm. this weird problem with communication. Yeah, I would think that the, the, the DA staff would, would definitely be part of that. Definitely be part of that. All right. Some good feedback. Um, you know, we are technically four minutes over time. I think we try and do the infrastructure working group still. Uh, if people do have to go because of other <clears throat> obligations, I think that's understandable. Uh, but for those that can stick around, to, you know, five more minutes, you know, please do. Yeah, well, I can thanks, stick Tatiana. Around. Thanks, Tatiana. All right, Jeff. thank you, Tatiana. So I'm filling in for uh, Gerhard and Ryan, who were unable to make it today. And uh, also for Rudy, who happens to be out sick. So <laughs> we were kind of uh, uh, a little bit decimated on the infrastructure side uh, for today's call. Um, so I'm just going to go through this really quickly. This is the who we are. You guys can read that. Uh, annual plan. A lot of this was covered in uh, the kind of update that Holly provided. So I'm not going to go into it in um, full detail, but go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, the big things for the last quarter, network isolation. We are working on some gateway servers that allow us for greater network isolation within the OSL, um, and also doing network isolation for things like our test bot infrastructure that we put on the Amazon Web Services environment. Um, we are continuing to work on the uh, Git move, moving that onto newer hardware. Uh, we're working on the staging and production. Those are nearly complete, and Ryan's been doing some great work in there helping us out. Um, upgrading the Drupal.org database servers, Holly mentioned, those were actually launched at uh, right around 5 p.m. Pacific time on Monday, and uh, we immediately noticed a 200% uh, increase uh, or increase in performance on query times um, in terms of how quickly overall the site is performing. 
Um, this also may have uh, allowed us to close out a couple of tickets that have been very long standing about uh, white screening problems on searches of, uh, of issue queues and things like that. So we were really excited to get that hardware in place. It took us a little longer than we planned, but it was well worth it. Um, it's actually frightening how little resources we're actually using on those machines. We keep talk joking about putting up stuff on them. Um, we've also introduced some Drupal-specific monitoring. Uh, one of the ways that we knew, knew that we had that big of a performance increase is because we're actually using New Relic in a evaluation uh, uh, stage right now on the applications and, and the server monitoring. Uh, current project status, uh, the OpenStack now hosts all dev and staging VMs. We have nothing on um, the older hardware there. Uh, the new private network switches are being used, which is good. And that, that ties into the, the gateway process that we were talking about earlier. Uh, Edgecast CDN is in front of all Drupal.org and subsites, and there's definitely been some performance noticed from that. Uh, we're also testing, it says Fastly, but we're actually testing both Max CDN and Fastly, um, looking for a solution for our download traffic. So this would be uh, traffic that comes from ftp.drupal.org, typically packaged projects. Um, CF Engine has been removed from all the servers except for Solar, Media, and Util, and we're very excited to get those last three knocked out here in the, uh, the early part of 2015. Uh, we continue to work on uh, reducing technical debt. Obviously, removing CF Engine has been a big part of this. Also, rewriting all the Puppet modules. Uh, simplifying our server module, uh, server management, and Holly touched on this. This is really important to the future of Drupal.org. We have to become um, independent of any particular hosting platform so that we can be as uh, nimble as possible and use all the best practices we should be using. Um, and that's all about the disconnecting those central services that we're currently using uh, at the OSL. Big things like uh, a big thing is actually going to be when we start transferring off of their mail servers. Um, that will be one of the, the bigger transitions that we have to take on in early 2015. Um, obviously, there will be a little bit on the charter updates front coming out of the infrastructure working group um, and those last little bits of finalizing. Actually, we could cross off the first one because uh, that was actually finalized already. Thank you. This is the benefit of having a fast talker for the last one. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. That was great, Josh. Thank you. Any, any, Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Any questions on that from anyone? No questions? All right. I think we can wrap up the meeting. Um, I'm sorry we didn't manage to go um, you know, a little faster so we could still go to the executive committee, but uh, fortunately, none of these things are uh, urgent, and so we can postpone them to next time. Um, thanks, everybody, for participating. Thanks for all the updates and uh, all the amazing progress. It's, uh, it's great to see all the, all the updates in between uh, the different board meetings, for yeah. sure. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And, um, have a great holiday, and I look forward to seeing you all in person in January. What are the dates on that? 21-22. And Holly, does that mean we don't have a normal board meeting in January? We have a normal board meeting in the middle of our retreat. Or right. we reschedule it. That's another topic. <laughs> OK. Thanks, everybody. You're all awesome. I love you all. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Yeah, happy holidays. Thanks, everyone. Great meeting. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.